be ashamed of the gospel. We'll not be ashamed of you, Jesus. We will honor you with our lives, Lord, not just our words. With everything in us, Lord. Father, just we just touch your heart today, Father. We just want to go deeper into your presence, Lord. We just love you so much. Good. 
we worship you. We worship you. Praise your name. Glory to you, Jesus. Glory and honor to you, Jesus. What the Lord is showing me, and I don't even know if the word showing is right, but as a congregation, it's not just the people who are here tonight, but it is this local fellowship. We are in a place where God has said He was taking us. And as we would put it, we are in a higher place with God. And we really, we never felt any emotions that indicated, well, today is the day of promotion, but we're there. And what the Lord is impressing upon me, and, and here's the analogy that He used. It's like a child on Christmas morning who walks into the room and, and just all these gifts, all these presents, just all over. And the child simply does not know what to do with everything that he's just discovered. The Lord says that we are in a place with Him now. There is so much more available to us and we don't yet realize what we have been promoted into. It's a, a larger, bigger room full of the things of God. And as time progresses, we're going to understand more clearly where we are. And we're going to understand more clearly how to partake of everything that is now available to us. It's as though the, it's like it's like we've started a new school year. And so much is new. And we're going to be learning how to use that which God has set before us. And what I'm seeing is that this is bringing about a strengthening in us, a spiritual strengthening, as though literal, as, as, though, as though spiritually speaking, we are developing larger muscles. We are becoming stronger in the Lord. And just like athletes who participate in the Olympics train very hard, the Lord is impressing upon me that we are at a place now to where we are better able to train harder than we ever have. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. We do not know how much is waiting to happen in this place and through us. And that's not just for those here, but all of those who are a part of this ministry wherever they are. Those who are walking this path with us. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We have been made more than conquerors. Bless you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We're in a good place. Thank you, Jesus. Guess we better go shopping for larger clothes so these muscles will fit. Well, why don't you get around and squeeze some muscle-bound hands? Hallelujah. It's good to see all of you. For all of you that are watching this, especially those who are first-time viewers, we invite you to come and be a part of our services, live and in person. We'd really like to have you here. And, uh, you know, watching is good, but being here in person, that's something special. Well, as you know, tomorrow is uh, a holiday. Columbus Day. Yeah. And, you know, the banks are closed, and the federal this and the federal that, and state this and everything's closed. And I, I don't know about you, but I just think it's so cool that they named a holiday after our state capital. Amen. <laughs> Amen. What's that? You know, Columbus Day, hallelujah. And it just gives everybody a, an opportunity to think about which football team they should root for. Hallelujah. So anyway, I already know who, I already know. I mean, it's not, I don't have to pray too much. I already know about this one. <laughs> uh, I forgot to mention this morning that on October 28th, on that Friday, there's going to be a bonfire. It's going to take place outside, in the back of the church. And uh, we're going to burn stuff and then <laughs> cook stuff over what we burn and, you know, just pretend we're pioneers or something. I don't know. So uh, I think we have plenty of wood. No, we're not burning the shed, okay? <laughs> I'm not so sure that would be a very healthy prospect. <laughs> we're going to be burning the right kind of wood. So if you have old furniture, don't bring it in. Because one thing you don't want to do is cook a hot dog over burning wood that's been painted or varnished or anything else. You know, mmm, tastes like shellac. Wow. <laughs> so that's the 28th. But then, when the bonfire's over, the fun begins. There will be a lock-in, a lock-in here at the church, which is different from a lock-out. I know of a pastor got really mad about some stuff. And he literally locked people out of the church and hired armed guards at the doors to keep them out. I am not a joking. It's true. And that's all I'll say about that. So this is a lock-in where we lock you in and we don't let you out. It, unless you give a love offering. <laughs> And for the adults that will be monitoring the children that night, I'm sure they'll be ready to give a love offering of any amount <laughs> to get out of here. But anyway, that'll be for the kids. Now, if you need more information about the lock-in, please see Tabitha. As far as I know, she has all the information about the lock-in. Because I sure don't. You will not find me anywhere near this building <laughs> during that lock-in. I will be changing my phone numbers. <laughs> Not really. But anyway, uh, that's the lock-in for the kids. What is the age group for that? 7 to 16. Seven to 16. That's a big age group. So if you're 7 to 16, which is not a whole lot of us in here tonight, but if you're 7 to 16, then uh, the lock-in is for you. And that'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> I say that by faith. That'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> At least for the kids, maybe not for the adults. All righty. Would you please open to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 
I'm going to give you a moment to turn over there because I want you to see this with me. I mean, truth is, anytime I tell you to turn anywhere, I want you to turn to it, see it with me. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're jumping in the middle of what Paul wrote, but we want to focus on a specific part of the verse we're going to read. Verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of his devices. Now, if we were to ask, or if I were to ask, and everybody get out a piece of paper right now, what are Satan's devices? You probably come up with a lot of interesting responses. And some people might say, well, you know, he, he tries to get us to, you know, get drunk. Or he tries to get us to smoke those nasty cigarettes. Or he tries to get us to do drugs, tries to get us to commit adultery, tries to get us to steal things, tries to get us to, um, you know, pornography or whatever, just a lot of that stuff. However, a clue to these devices is in the word itself. Because this word devices, I didn't actually write down the Greek word, but it says we are not ignorant of his and this word devices, part of its meaning, its main thrust is thoughts, concepts of the mind. We are not ignorant of his way of thinking and the concepts of his mind. Another way to say that would be, <laughs> there are several ways we could say that. But let me put it like this. We are not so stupid that we cannot detect his thoughts and concepts of the mind the way that he thinks when it comes to trying to mess us up. So therefore, he thinks, then he acts. Well, everybody does that. But when it comes to derailing us, his approach is far different than what a lot of Christians would think. Now, I want to give you an example of his devices, and it's found over in Matthew chapter 4. Turn over there, Matthew chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, let's begin reading in verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But Jesus answered him said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time Thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written, Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, considering what we just read, in which of these verses, now I don't mean any of this to be a trick question, okay? But in which of these verses did Satan say, If thou be the Son of God, Take this bottle of whiskey and drink it. It's not in there. 
In which of these verses did he say, check out that hottie over there. She's ripe for the pickings. Go get her. Well, he didn't say that, did he? In which of these verses did he say, hey, that guy left his wallet right there. It's got a bunch of money in it. Why don't you pick it up and run? Didn't say that. There's nothing in here about drugs. There's not, none of that is in there. You see this? What is in here? Satan, this is an example of a device. And what Satan is doing here is attacking Jesus with a device, and this device is challenging his belief system and his way of thinking. Another way to say it would be this. He's challenging Jesus' doctrine. If you're the Son of God, then these things. And notice Jesus says, in verse 4, it is written, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Well, the next time Satan comes up to him, he says, if you be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. He's challenging how much Jesus knows about the Word of God. But it's not just how much he knows about the Word of God. It's how much he knows about the message of the Word of God. Now, we're not going to turn to it, but this verse 6, where, where Satan... Now, Satan's quoting Scripture. Do you see this? This is the devil speaking. The devil says, It is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands... They shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now that is a quote from Psalm 91. And it's verses 11 and 12 from Psalm 91. Satan is quoting Scripture. This is so critical. Satan is quoting Scripture. Now I've heard some people teach about the devil, you know, Satan, demons, and so forth, as though they are absolutely, totally so dumb, so stupid, they don't know anything about the Bible. I mean, that's kind of the impression they give you. When in reality, I would go so far as to say, Satan, at least Satan, maybe not all the demons, but Satan at least, probably has more scripture memorized than all Christians. Now somebody would say, well, you're exalting the devil. No, I'm not exalting the devil. You'll notice Satan knew exactly which verse. He, Satan did not run and get his Bible and his concordance to look up this passage. <laughs> he knew what to try and use against Jesus. And so he says, look, if you're the Son of God, we'll do this. It's in the Bible. It is written. Jesus did not turn around and say, it is not written. That's not in Scripture. God never put that in there. No, Jesus, this is kind of abstract, Jesus came in agreement with him by virtue of not saying it isn't written. He's saying, okay, yeah, it's true, that may be written, however, it's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So now you have two people using Scripture as a sword fight. <laughs> See what I mean? But Satan wasn't wrong. That verse, what he's quoting from now, that is in Psalm 91. It's in there. However, the way Satan used it is not the way God meant it. That's not the message. Now let me simplify this because we're not going to turn to Psalm 91 tonight. In Psalm 91, basically, uh, God is saying, you know, I'm going to watch over you and angels will be there to help you and so forth and you know, and let me, I'm paraphrasing, okay? If you trip and fall, don't worry, you won't dash your foot. Now that's a, a real loose paraphrase. But it's talking about God watching over somebody, and if something, you know, an accident happens, well, he'll be there to help you out. But here, Satan is twisting it and saying, jump. <laughs> Just jump. Well, that's not what that passage is about. However... 
What if Jesus didn't know the message contained in the passage where those verses were pulled? You understand what I'm saying? If Jesus had not understood the message of Psalm 91, he might have said, well, I'll show you. I am the Son of God. And takes uh, just jumps. Oh, that'd be crazy. What we're seeing here in, in this Matthew chapter 4 is a prime example of the way Satan attacks nearly all Christians. Well, in fact, I'll go so far as to say all Christians. This is where he attacks. I do not believe that he can convince the majority of Christians to go smoking, go drinking, go carousing, go stealing, pornoing, blah, 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 etc. I don't believe he can convince the majority of Christians to go do that. But I'll tell you what he can do. He can mess you up big time on your doctrine if you don't know what's going on. This is his device. Because, see, what he was trying to do here in this passage was challenge Jesus concerning what Jesus believed about himself and to create doubt in the mind of Jesus about who he was. He's trying to uh, get Jesus to misapply what God had said, meaning what's, what's in Scripture. And in the process of doing that, he would have been able to shift Jesus' thinking away from the message of God's Word and onto a twisted doctrine of Satan's that came about from a misappropriation of Scripture. Do you understand what I mean by that? Now, this was not an attack on Jesus' physical body. A lot of people talk about, well, you know, the devil hit me with sickness. The devil did it. Okay, well, praise God. I mean, no, don't praise God for sickness. I mean, <laughs> that didn't make any sense. <laughs> well, you know, just, just praise God anyway. It's a good thing to do. But, well, the devil attacked me with sickness. Well, the devil attacked me, you know, the car broke down. Well, the devil attacked me. Okay, okay, okay. But do you not realize that's just minor stuff? What he's really after is to get you to question who you are in Christ. That's the goal. That is, now, now look over in Second uh, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. What I'm sharing with you tonight is what I truly believe, based on what I'm seeing in, in the Word of God, is the biggest problem in the body of Christ today. The body of Christ, the, the, yeah, okay, a lot of Christians get into sin. We know that. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is, what do you know about the Word of God? What do you believe about the Word of God? What do you believe about who you are in Christ? That's the biggest problem. See, Satan is like, Jesus was hungry. Now, when you're hungry, there is physical weakness associated with the hunger. When people are hungry after fasting, some people have so much, well, in today's society, they've eaten so much junk food, they've got so many toxins in their body that fasting can cause them to have flu-like symptoms because they're purging their body of, of the toxins. Well, that wouldn't have been so much back then. But what I'm getting at is Satan completely ignored the fact that Jesus was hungry and in a weakened physical condition. He went after his belief system. He didn't attack his body. He went straight for his belief system. You think you're the Son of God. What makes you think you're the Son of God? Well, because 40 days ago I got dunked in water and when I came out, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. <laughs> so that was kind of a clue. <laughs> See what I mean? 
If you be the Son of God. Well, I am the Son of God. There is no if. Turn these stones to bread. No, you don't understand. I am the Son of God because God said I am His Son. Do you understand this? Therefore, I don't have to prove anything to you. Do you realize that in Romans, in Romans chapter 8, it talks about those of us who are born again and that the Holy Spirit is bearing witness, or he's doing everything he can to bear witness, with, trying to get us to listen, bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So God, by the Holy Spirit, is speaking speaking to us, you're my child, you're my child, you, hey, you know what, if God were going to speak from the heavens, any one of you could stand up in this room, and God would speak, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased, that is what God would say. Do you hear me? Well, the way I was acting today, I just, now hold on. That's based on your interpretation of what God would say. Listen to me. There is no way, no way that God would say over any of you, this is my liked son. <laughs> in whom I am greatly displeased. <laughs> he wouldn't do that. And see, when I said that, you guys chuckled. He wouldn't do that. We put degrees of God's love on ourselves based upon how we see us and how we define ourselves relative to who God is or who we think He is. Every single one of you, if, if it was your time for this, and we had you stand up, and God spoke. He would say, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. All of you, there are no exceptions. This is what he would do. But for each one of us, even though God has said, my Holy Spirit's bearing witness with your spirit that you are my children, Satan is buffeting us with his devices to challenge that belief system. To challenge those thoughts. Look here in 2 Peter chapter 3. Just begin in verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful, or let me say it like this, that you may have a mind full of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. And we'll stop right there. He's saying in the last days there are going to be scoffers who are going to rise up. And I'm telling you what to do to prepare for it. Make sure that your mind is full of Scripture. That your mind is full of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us the apostles. Now let me simplify this, or say it differently. Make sure that you're mindful or have a mind full of what God has spoken both in the Old and the New Testament. The living Word of God. You need the New Testament but when you go back in the Old Testament and you start reading, you see a whole lot prophesied about the body of Christ. Go through the book of Psalms, you're going to see things in there about the body of Christ. Go through the book of Proverbs, you're going to see the Holy Spirit speaking to us about His words and what they'll do for our lives. And He says, look, there are scoffers that are going to rise. Okay, let's look at another place. Over in Jude. Jude, well, one chapter. Jude 1. And in verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. In other words, to Christians, <laughs> to believers, 
Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now that word, that phrase, faith, which was once delivered unto the saints, he's, he's saying the teaching that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. In other words, there's going to be no more scripture written. This is it. No more testaments. No more new revelations. And he says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when he says this, he's, he's describing these people as men who have crept in unawares. Meaning, well, where'd they creep in? Creep in cre creeping into what? Into our midst. Creeping into your... Well, if they're not creeping into my midst, why should I be concerned? See this? I mean, if, if, they ha if it's nothing to do with me, why should I be concerned? There are certain men who have been creeping in, but you weren't aware of this. And who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now that's really King Jamesy. Let me say it a little bit differently for the sake of understanding. These guys or, or, or their actions, it was prophesied that they were going to do this, that this was coming. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this phrase denying Jesus, that whole last part of it, it's not saying they're going to stand up and say, Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Jesus Christ is not the Christ. Jesus Christ, is, that's not it. What it means is, that phrase, deny, we're denying in this passage, it means standing in opposition to, or standing in disagreement to, no longer in agreement with. Now, if you look over in verse 17, we're going to get a little bit more information about these people. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. This is very similar, though not word for word identical, but very similar to what we just read over there in 2 Peter. About, well, over in 2 Peter, the word scoffers was used, but here we see the word mockers, and it says that they're going to walk after their own lust and so forth. Now, here's what's interesting. In 2 Peter, you have the word scoffers. In Jude, you have the word mockers, and they both come from the exact same Greek word. They mean the same thing. It means false prophets or misleading teachers. False prophets or misleading teachers. Well, what did Jesus say in Matthew? He said, in the last times, false prophets shall arise. False prophets or misleading teachers. Now, notice he says they're creeping in. They're in our midst. They're a part of the body of Christ. And he says, they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Another way to say that would be, they're twisting the message of grace to make it sound like you can do whatever you want and it doesn't matter. That's literally what this is saying. Okay, do I need to say a whole lot about what's being preached in the body of Christ today? You're seeing this come to pass right before your very eyes. And he says, in these last days, scoffers and mockers, false prophets, misleading teachers are going to rise up and they're going to begin delivering a message that stands in opposition to Jesus. Well, let's get some more information about this. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times 
some shall depart from the faith. Now look at this. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now what's interesting is that where he says there are people that are going to depart from the faith. Well, you can't depart from what you never had in the first place. They're going to depart from the faith. Remember what Jude said? It's needful for me to write unto you about this faith. And they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Notice in verses 1 and 2, there is nothing specific about getting drunk, adultery, stealing, etc., etc. See what I mean? This is all relative to teaching. It's all relative to doctrine, all of it. And he says, they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're going to listen to lies. In other words, these guys are going to do what Jesus didn't do in Matthew 4. Because Satan approached Jesus with twisted doctrine. If you be the Son of God, well, I am. Okay, well then here's doctrine for you, to kind of paraphrase what he did. Well, it didn't work with Jesus. But what we're seeing here in 2 Peter and in Jude, and then here, we are seeing that in some people it's going to work. And notice they're searing their conscience. Searing their conscience. In other words, and I'll be gracious, some of these people are going to sear their conscience to the point to where it doesn't matter what you say or show them in Scripture, they will refuse to change what they teach. It's not going to make any difference whatsoever. Now to see more about this, look over in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, what are these fables? The twisting of the word of God. Just what Satan did to Jesus, it is written. The angels will keep you from bumping your toes. And Jesus says, oh, wait a minute, it is written again. In other words, you, what, you want to have a, a scripture quoting contest with me, Satan? <laughs> Who do you think is going to win that one? And by the way, Satan, I'll leave it in context. I'll deliver the message of what the verses mean. What this is revealing to us is that in these last days, these people, the scoffers, the mockers, who are the teachers in this passage, who are the the seducing spirit listeners back over there in 1 Timothy, these people are going to be in the churches, in the pulpits, on television, in the bookstores, etc., etc., delivering doctrine that has all kinds of scripture but does not contain the message given by God. And people are going to be flocking to them, having itching ears. If this goes on long enough, I'm, I'm being facetious about this. Let me say it a little bit differently. The longer it goes on, the more people it appeals to. And the more people begin to buy into it. That's why some of these churches that are being pastored by scoffers and mockers, they're running thousands upon thousands of people. 
But if you were to go to those people and go to those pastors and ask them, do you really love Jesus Christ? They'd tell you they'd lay their life down for him. Of course I love Jesus. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love Jesus. And there's no sin in my life. I'm faithful to my wife. You know, I, I don't drink. I, none of this stuff. In other words, there is no discernible sin. You understand what I mean by that? However, <laughs> there is discernible sin if you know how to discern it. Because when these people stand up and deliver their messages, they become the mouthpiece for Satan. They are doing to the body of Christ the same thing that Satan did in Matthew chapter 4. It's just, they're not talking about, well, turn stones into bread. They're talking about other things. They're not telling you to go jump off a cliff. They're talking about other things, but it's the same device. And this is the most dangerous device that Satan uses. Let's go back to uh, John chapter 8. I want you to see what Jesus said about all this because this was happening even back when Jesus ministered. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, in the middle of uh, John chapter 8, when well, Jesus is teaching and he is being criticized as usual by the religious leaders. And in verse 44, he says, You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Think about this. There had never been a lie until Satan told it. <laughs> the very first lie ever was told by Satan. Now, I'm not really sure exactly what that lie was. Because he did deceive one-third of the angels. So he had to have been lying to them about something. We just don't have those lies recorded in Scripture. But we do have the lie in, in Genesis, ye shall not die. You're going to be like God. He's been holding out on you. You can't really trust him, but you sure can trust me. In fact, if you, you don't have to turn to it now, but when you go back to Genesis chapter 3, you'll see Satan making reference to what God had said. Now, in this, Jesus says, you're of, the, of your father the devil. Well, we know they weren't literally the offspring of Satan. We know that. What he's talking about is you share in the same nature as Satan. And he says, the lusts of your father you will do. Remember what we read uh, previously, how that these scoffers and the mockers and the the teachers, these false teachers and all, that they're going to be teaching things that appeal to the lusts of people. But when you think of lusts, don't think exclusively of, you know, physical intimacy. It's whatever appeals to the flesh. You know, I've read stories about churches that have had, um, <laughs> they've had beer tasting parties. That's weird. And if you think, really, where is this church? Then you're weird. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Beer tasting parties. Churches that are holding services in bars and serving drinks, you know, to appeal to people. Uh, what are you going to do? We're, we're going to have service in a bar because we really want to drink, all right? No, they're not going to tell you that. We're going to hold service in a bar so that the people who don't want anything to do with church can be exposed to the gospel. And then you have a bunch of Christians who hear that and they think, wow, yeah. I mean, those people aren't coming into the church. We need to go where they are. Really? And you got that where? Because that's, now listen, because that's what Jesus did. He went where the sinners are. Sweetheart, I've got a choice. I mean, I've got a, a, a news for you. He didn't have a choice in the matter. Everywhere he went, they were sinners. It wasn't like he could go to church and there'd be a bunch of Christians there waiting for him. 
They were all sinners. Everywhere he went, he was surrounded by sinners. Surrounded by lost people. If you think Jesus went walking into the bars looking for the lost, <laughs> he didn't do that. And you have a lot of Christians, you know the thing about the searing the conscience? A lot of Christians are searing their consciences and thinking this is an effective form of evangelism. There's one church, they have a service, like some kind of a Bible study, something or other, in a bar, and you know, the, the beer's passed and whatever, and, and they all sit around and they, like, they'll take verses of Scripture and and they'll all give their input and their thoughts about the verse. Excuse me. What? And see, now Christians, they think, well, I, I just, well, that's a good idea. Have an open discussion about the Word of God. Where in the Word do you see have an open discussion about the Word of God? And some people hearing this might think, well, Brother Martin, wait. I mean, what if people have questions? Well, praise God, everybody's got questions. We all do. But when you have an open discussion, you're, everybody, everybody becomes a preacher. Everybody wants to deliver their doctrine. Everybody, see, when I was teaching at uh, Life Christian University and Grace Ministries Bible College, I didn't take questions. And there were students that, you know, would raise their hand. They had a question. And I'd just keep teaching. <laughs> Seriously. Or I'd say, uh, just write that question down and give it to me during the break. And I'll take a look at it. And just go on. One time, one time only did I take questions. And it was while I was teaching at Life Christian University. I know there was like 60, 70, 80 students. I did it one time to prove a point. So I took a question. Yes, you have a question. Well, I'm going to go my bed, some blah, 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 And then somebody over here, well, you know what, at our church, and, this, and it starts. And I just stood there and just, just watched and let it happen. Just watched it. And it went all the way to the break. And then we had our break, and we came back. And I said, do you guys see what just happened? I let one question be asked. And from that point on, class was over. Did you guys see what happened? And they were all like, yeah. I said, I said, so now we're going to be challenged to finish the material for tonight. This is why I do not take questions. When I first came to this church as the pastor, what I did not know, well, actually, it, might, it was probably before I was the pastor, yeah, because I was coming on Sunday nights to help them till they found a pastor. <laughs> Lo and behold, it was me. So... Is on Sunday night and I'm teaching, and all of a sudden, somebody interjected something, and it threw me off. I said, what? I'm like, huh? Um, well, yeah, answer, answer, answer. And, and, I, and people could tell by the look on my face, like, what's going on? Well, then somebody explained how on Sunday nights, it's kind of an open forum for people to interact with the pastor while he's preaching. And, you know, that didn't last very long. <laughs> we, we, as Barney Fife would say, we nipped it in the bud. Because that ain't going to happen. Now, here's what I'm getting at. Jesus is warning that Satan is a liar. And what do liars do? They lie. So he says, look. You share the same nature as your father, the devil. Well, I'm sure that didn't win him any friends that day. He says, the lust of your father you will do. In other words, whatever appeals to the flesh, you know, you guys act on this. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not the truth because there's no truth in him. There's no truth in it. There, listen, there's no truth in him, yet he can quote Scripture. Now listen to this. This is really going to change. This is going to challenge some people. There is no truth in him, but he can quote Scripture. Well, I thought the Word of God was true. Well, it is. Well, then there must be truth in him. 
There is, if Jesus says there's no truth in him, there's, there's no truth in him. Who are you arguing with here now? Do you realize what Jesus is saying? I mean, what's, what he's trying to get across to us. There is no truth in him. Therefore, when he quotes scripture, that doesn't make scripture a lie, but what he does is twist scripture so you do not understand the truth of scripture. See this? There's no truth in him. Absolutely none. He is a liar. Now let's see this in action. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now right then, these guys should have realized they stuck their foot in their mouth. Why do they transgress the tradition of the elders? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Oops. <laughs> For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. And that's interesting. Let him die the death. <laughs> I mean, isn't dying death? I mean, let him die the death. Kill him to death. But ye say... Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Man, let this one sink in. He says, in vain they do worship me. Here's a sermon title, When Your Worship is in Vain. Now, I want you to get a hold of this. He says, in vain do these people, you people, worship me, worship God, Teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. In other words, the fullness of what worship could do is countered by the doctrine you teach. Think of it like this. There's a lot of powerful worship today in the body of Christ. And a lot of the worship is true, meaning what they sing is true. But when they turn around and deliver as doctrine a tradition... They are nullifying the impact of that worship. Now let's look at this a little bit differently over in Mark chapter 7. It's the same story, and we'll pick it up in verse 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain other scribes which came from Jerusalem. When they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash and eat, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Holding in vain do they worship me, or howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things do ye. Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition." For Moses said, Honor thy father and mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, A gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. My question would be, Where did these traditions come from? 
Where? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They didn't come up with that on their own. They had the word of God. They had the law and the prophets. That is all they needed. But they started coming up with these ideas. Well, we need to do this. And we don't need to do that. And they began teaching the people, this is the way it is. They began adding to the word of God, twisting the message of the word of God while not denying the word of God. They never said, stop listening to the law and the prophets. Stop reading. The they never said that. What they said was, here's the law and the prophets, and here's what else you need to do. This is, this is revelation. If they had said, this is what we got from the devil last night, so we want you guys to do it. Well, that'd be nuts. But if they stand up and they start talking about, this is the revelation we received. In fact, here's what's interesting. If you study your history, now this is not in scripture, but it is in Jewish history. One of the ways that the Pharisees and the scribes came up with all this stuff, the religious leaders among the Jews, um, they said, they, they told the people, what we're teaching you, now I don't know specifically if it had to do with the washing of the cups and all that, but a lot of the traditions, they said, we're teaching you more of what God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now he gave Moses all these things that we have recorded, but there were other things that did not get recorded at that time. And these are the things that have been passed down orally through the generations. And that is what we are teaching you. This is the word of God. Well, the people sit there and they listen to this. They did not, for whatever the reason, nobody, well, maybe some people did stand up and say, wait a second, I'm sorry. But if it's not here in the scrolls, I don't believe it. You guys can say whatever you want, but I'm not buying into that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to... Well, you know how well that would have gone. They would have been kicked out. What happens today in churches where traditions have been made equal or superior to the Word of God? Stand up and say one thing about it, boom, you're out of there. There's no difference. It's the same thing that's happening today. Now look over in Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to close with this passage. Hebrews chapter 5. See, what I'm sharing with you tonight, this is a key to protecting yourself in the last times. Because if you don't know the Word of God and the message, see, you can have all kinds of Scripture memorized, you can have the whole Bible memorized, but if you don't understand the message of what you've memorized, then you just have it memorized. And this is why a lot of Christians are so impressed by preachers who can just quote scripture like crazy. Well, you know, I think that's neat when people have that kind of a strong memory. But better than that, I think it's neater when people understand the message of what's contained in scripture. And if you don't have it memorized, hey, I'm cool with that. But if you know what it's saying, that's what I want. I don't care if you have to... to read your notes. I don't care. I want, I want the message. I want what's contained in here. Now he says in Hebrews chapter, he's talking here about Jesus. And in verse 11 he says, of whom, meaning Jesus, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. In other words, there's so much more that we'd like to teach you guys. The problem is, it's hard for us to teach this because you're dull of hearing. In other words, you're at a place to where you would not receive what we would say. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, you've been here long enough, you've heard this long enough, you ought to be at a place to where you could convey these truths to other people around you. Not necessarily from the teacher's position, but to other people around you. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a 
babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, who are are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now the good and evil he's talking about here is not about, well, should I steal my neighbor's car or not? I mean, (laughs) you have a conscience that's going to tell you, you're not supposed to be doing that. This is not talking about sin and non-sin. This is talking about good and evil doctrine. Right and wrong doctrine. Here's how we know this. He says, you need somebody to come along and teach you again what you've already heard. The very basic, elementary, entry-level teachings of what it means to be a Christian. You have regressed to the point, we're going to have to give, give you milk all over again. Because you can't handle strong meat. He says, everyone that uses milk, now look at this, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Every, do you realize that the scoffers and the mockers cannot give you meat? Even maybe if at one time they could, they have regressed. And they need somebody to teach them the first principles. But they're in a position, you think they're going to receive that? You have backslidden, brother. What do you mean I'm backslidden? I'm not drunk. I don't watch stuff. I'm not cheating. On, I'm, not, I'm not a backslider. Oh, yeah, you are. You're a worse backslider than the guy that backslid back into his pot. Because that guy smoking pot isn't going to deceive people to turn away from the truth. But you, with your scoffing, mocking doctrine, yeah, you're leading people out the door of the kingdom. And he says... They're unskillful in the word of righteousness because they're babes. It's actually possible as a believer to go back to being like a babe in Christ. Isn't that incredible? How is that possible? By making a decision to replace truth with tradition. And he says, strong meat belongs to those that are of full age. In other words, believers who are of more maturity, spiritual maturity, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised or their discerners exercised to know the difference between good and evil, grace and the law, right and wrong doctrine. Now where he says, those who by reason of use, what is it that they're using? Meat. They're using the meat. In other words, feeding, feeding, feeding on the meat. They've gone beyond the milk, and they're feeding, feeding, feeding on the milk, so, on the meat, so that when some, when a scoffer or a mocker, it doesn't matter who it is, when a scoffer or a mocker stands up and begins delivering what sounds so good and sounds so true, for example, and I know none of you would fall into this, but man, I don't know how many tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of people have bought into this, the teaching that in 1 John, the first chapter of 1 John was not written to Christians, it was written to the lost. That is a lie. It is an absolute lie. Because if you take 1 John, remove chapter and verse breaks, and rewrite it word for word as a letter, just as a regular letter, it is impossible, impossible to come up with, well, chapter 1 was written to the lost, not to Christians. It's impossible. And if you meditate in it and leave it line upon line, precept upon precept, you'll see, you will discern that chapter 1 was indeed written to believers. Well, that's just one example of all of this. And he's saying, look, the more that you get into the Word, now notice whose senses are being exercised or developed. Each individual person. What that means is this. As a believer, you can come to the place of being able to discern what is and is not correct doctrine, and you don't need to send the pastor an email. I'm serious. And I get emails and questions from people, and I'm thinking, seriously? As much as you've heard taught? You're asking this? 
you really don't know. Don't, that's not how I reply to them. You know what? You dope. What is wrong? With, no, I don't do that. I mean, you know. But generally what I do is point them to a sermon or a teaching series. I'm not going to get into a back and forth email thing. I'm not playing ping pong. I'm not doing that. I will give you a sermon. I'll give you a series to listen to. And that's it. And if you don't want to take it from there, that's totally up to you. you know, I mean, one person... You know, in essence, what they said was, I don't have time to listen. It's like, really, but you've got time to send me an email. You've got time to sit around and think about all this stuff, but you don't have time to, send, to sit down and listen to teaching? Sorry. You know, there's not much I can do. And I've replied to that effect to some people. You know, if you're not going to go with the Word, there's nothing I can do for you. I have no platform. There's nothing that I can do to help you out. The closer we get to the return of Jesus... See, you guys... Here's the thing. In this church... One of the downsides to being in this church... You're far more accountable. <laughs> How does that make you feel? You're far more accountable. But the good thing is... You are going to be harder to deceive... Than most believers. Far harder to deceive... And praise God for that. However, that does not eliminate for us, and I'm, now listen, I'm in this too. I, I'm deceivable as well, even though I'm the guy up here that's got, you know, pastor. You know, I'm deceivable as well. So for all of us, we've got to continue feasting on milk, meat, dessert. <laughs> you know, your words are sweet like honey. There's your dessert. We have to continue in this so that our spiritual senses are exercised or developed so that as soon as somebody starts teaching stuff wrong, we will discern the difference. See, and God calls wrong doctrine evil. We'll be able to discern the difference between good and evil. Now, granted, the further we go into God, we're going to hear teaching that will be new to us and we may sit back and think, well, now, wait a minute. What? 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 And if it's a teacher who will line upon line, precept upon precept, they'll bring it forth in a way to where you might have to listen to the sermon two or three times, but you'll get it. Following along the scripture, you'll get it. You'll get it. I mean, that's the way it is. It's called homework. <laughs> Remember in school, the teacher would show you some stuff on the board and then say, okay, do, you know, problems 12 through 95. <laughs> It's like, seriously? Why? Because they want you to go over and over and over and over and over so that when the test comes, you pass. Same thing with the Word of God. The test is when wrong doctrine is delivered. I'm going to pass that test. <laughs> Praise God. So stay in the Word, feast on it, and get those spiritual senses exercised to discern the difference between a lie and truth. Glory to God. Please stand. Father, I pray for everybody who's heard this sermon that we do not get to the place of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought, believing that, well, I'm at a point where I don't, I don't really need the word that much anymore. Father, we cannot get to that point. We always no matter how mature we are in you, we always need the Word and we need more of it. And Father, I just want to thank you that my parents and my school teachers worked with me and taught me how to read. I am so glad that I know how to read so I can open your Word and read it. Even though some of the words are kind of hard to pronounce, Father, the fact remains I can read the Bible. And I am so glad that I can do that. Thank you. And Father, I just pray for all of us that we will have an increasing hunger to read the Bible. And may our senses, our spiritual discerners, continually be strengthened. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise your name, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Well, praise God. We can go ahead and be dismissed. Praise the Lord. Now, if you have anything you'd like me to pray with you about before you leave, I'll do that. Those of you watching, you can send prayer requests and we will pray over them. Just use the contact us form there at the website and uh, just we'll pray for you. And then uh, if you have an offering tonight before you leave, go ahead and bring it up. Those of you watching, you can send an offering by way of PayPal or the mailing address is there at the website as well. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in person. Okay, you guys have a blessed evening. Enjoy this wonderful, cool weather. Ah, feels so good. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, we'll see you later. Bye-bye now.